Welcome back to my shop, stranger. It's about um, 9 o'clock here at my shop. I've been working on a uh, Olympus OM-1 all day. The uh, OM-1 is kind of special to me because back in 1975, I bought a new one for myself. The photography community at that time was kind of stirred up and excited about it because the camera was so small and light compared to the Nikons and Minoltas of the day. The Pentax was, still, uh, was uh, also small and light, but the Olympus was even smaller and lighter. And uh, everybody was kind of excited about it at that time. you got to realize in uh, 1975, um, there, we didn't have iPhones. We had uh, cameras and uh, stereo equipment, and that's generally every year what we got excited about it when the new products came out. But anyway, I'm rambling here. I've um, reached a halfway point. It's been cleaned, lubricated, adjusted, et cetera, et cetera. I'll probably put it back together tomorrow morning, but now is a good time to um, take you through it and make a video. So let's get started. I think I'll start with the um, top cover, which I normally do. Okay, there it is. Maybe a little closer here. There we go. This um, OM-1 is the black model. They had the uh, silver and the black model. There's absolutely no difference between the two models, except for the color. At that time, professional photographers shooting the high dollar Nikon equipment were they black. Why they were black, I don't know. But um, the uh, consumer models, which is what I purchased, um, always offered a black model, but uh, it cost extra, about $20, $25. And uh, people bought them. Even myself, I bought some just because they looked cool. And uh, so this customer sent me a black model, which is kind of nice. Let's try this other camera over here. I have to move it here to the side a little. OM-1, yeah. 1975 is when I bought mine. I think they were out at that time or maybe 74. The uh, camera uh, made quite a stir in the film community because it was so light. It was a very small camera. It had a uh, rangefinder feel about it, but uh, it was a full SLR. It also, it had some um, special design prism, computer design. At that time, everything was, this was computer design, that was computer design. It was a selling point because computers were fairly new back then. Individuals didn't own them, but uh, the factories did own them, and they uh, quite often would advertise that fact that something was computer designed. And anyway, by doing so, the uh, prism was, uh, oh, it looks to me just, I never measured it, but about half the size of a normal prism. See inside, it looks like some brass is showing, which means this top cover is brass. They always made the uh, camera parts normally out of brass, aluminum, or steel. Okay, set that aside. And let's go back to this other camera here. Bottom cover. I always like to check the bottom cover to see how much wear is in the camera. As you can see, there's no visible scratches. At least there's no metal showing. This bottom, I can't tell if it's aluminum or if it's... Um, brass. It looks to me like it's aluminum. Anyway, if scratches show through the paint, maybe the cameras had a lot of use. I've seen some that were just totally worn out. Looks like they had taken sandpaper to the uh, camera. But this one looks really like it's in good shape, so hopefully the customer treated the camera well. Okay, let's set this aside and move on to something else. Okay, next we're going to look at the um, film door. Kind of a simple thing that uh, most people would say, well, why do you want to look at a film door? I mean, they're so dull. Because it tells you about the history of the camera. Look at that uh, film plate. I uh, am looking at it here. I'm not looking, like it. I'm not looking at it through a loop but it looks to me like there's been very little film shot through the camera. So it's, it tells you the history of the camera. It may have been carried around a lot, but there hasn't been much film through it because if there was film shot through the camera, 
the uh, film plate would be scratched up. And I don't know if I can get this. Um, the trouble is that, that uh, the camera's black and the uh, camera focus and the exposure don't know exactly what to do. So we may have some problems shooting this picture or this uh, video as the focus and the uh, exposure try to find their place. The, um, where's my probe here? Color probe, it's tweezers. You can see some wear here, 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 and down, get it up here, right there. So the camera was carried up here but uh, even though it was carried around, not much film was shot through it. Leather looks really good. You can always tell if the camera's been used by the wear on the leather. And the leather on this looks new. Let's get this one over here. Seems to focus a little bit better on the black, this particular lens. I've got macros on, uh, I've got three different macros, and uh, this one here is the one that uh, usually gives the least, least trouble. I think it's a 16. Okay. Oh, just a minor point. This is a quick release here for um, installing a different back on the camera, a data back that would give you your uh, date. I never used them, but some people wanted them. A lot of cameras didn't have this. It's a handy little feature. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's go and move on to something else. Before I move on to the uh, main body, I uh, grab the uh, lens here for the OM-1. A little bit different, the um, f-stop ring was more toward the front. As you can see there, 1.8 all the way down to f-16. Where on other cameras, it's toward the back. That's because the mechanism that controls it is up here. Or on the other the Nikon or the Minolta, the mechanism that controls the uh, aperture is back here. And then for locking and unlocking it, you had these uh, two studs you pushed in. Or on the uh, Nikon or Minolta, the stud was on the body. A different design. I often wondered about that. Uh, whoever built it, take that off. Whoever made the uh, Olympus OM-1 definitely was uh, thinking outside the box. This is a 50 millimeter, 1.8. That's your standard lens that it came with. I had one of these. And that's enough about the uh, that filter there looks um, never heard of that company well that's enough about the lens okay what do we look at next here um, how about the mirror cage Olympus OM-1 mirror cage and that is going to be hard to... The screen is out right now. I always remove the screen because I don't want to damage it while I'm working on the camera. We've got the um, speeds here on the Olympus. They're on the barrel here, which was very handy. The uh, Nikon and the Minolta, you had to reach and turn a knob on the top. But with this camera, you didn't have to do that. You could just use your fingers while you're focusing and change your speed. Much handier system. And there on here on top, we'll, um, this right here is the, um, if I can get my light here, galvanometer, that's your needle. Um, viewfinder. Over here, the uh, meter switch. Little circuit board, nothing in it but um, some resistors. Very simple system. 
Here on the side is the uh, self-timer. Awfully large for such a simple function. Over here, the uh, levers controlling the mirror. See if we can fire that mirror. Push that forward. Push a lever right here, if I'm not mistaken. And there it goes. You can see it popped up. Can't see it very well, though. The exposure system doesn't know exactly what to set the exposure for with that uh, silver uh, lens mount and all the black inside. Might be able to lighten it up a little bit in uh, Vegas Pro. I'll have to wait and see. Okay. I think I may have already said that Prism was uh, computer designed, very small, much smaller than the uh, Nikon or the Nolta. Made the camera very light. That was the whole point of the uh, OM-1, was to make it small and make it light. Okay, set that aside and move on to something else. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at here is the uh, camera body. I usually I say that for last. And there it is. Different than the uh, Nikon of Minolta. Let's put this over here. Maybe it'll help if shaking. The uh, Olympus OM-1, the mechanism that controls the speed, is in the bottom. Where with the Nikon and Minolta, they're at the top. And... Uh, when you turn, well, you probably can't see it here, but this lever here is engaged to the front, to the speeds. And as you change your speeds, it moves this gear. And there, there's a cam right here, and that changes the uh, speeds. And here at the bottom are is the, your charging mechanism. And I don't know what these do, it's been a while. The trouble with camera repairmen is that um, we do this month after month and year after year and we forget what's what. You know when you start, but you over time forget. I'm charging the uh, curtains now. And if you'll look at this right here, this will pop back in its starting position, like so. There's a small spring in there. It's a uh, weak point of the camera. A little bit of sand from the beach or something can get in there and lock that up. And then the camera comes to me and I've got to take this out and this out, remove the sand, oil it, and put it back, get it going again. And when it's charged, you can fire it by pressing the release lever and pressing a lever there in the bottom. And that appears to be it set at one second right at the same time. Again, okay, the, uh, go about halfway here, opening curtain, closing curtain, cloth covered in rubber, which is the normal for most of these uh, horizontal shutters. The, uh, to adjust the horizontal shutter speed, this right here is the closing this run here's the opening they both have to be going at the same speed or you won't have correct um, shutter speeds which normally will be between uh, 12 and uh, 14 se uh, milliseconds I have a chart that tells me what to set them for there's a little bit of play in there but not much most of the uh, articles or videos teach you how to set the speeds, but they don't teach you anything about the curtain times. Uh, buying a curtain time tester is, uh, is expensive. Uh, you can buy a, a, a handheld shutter speed tester that, uh, for $99, but uh, if you're checking the curtains, you're going to need a tester that costs a lot more than that. Okay, up here at the top, we have the... Um, advanced lever mechanism this gear here is carbon steel this one right here is carbon steel most advanced levers are always going to be 
carbon steel because there's a lot of pressure on that. Sometimes they will break, the teeth will break off because it's brittle, but they have to be strong to withstand the advancing over and over and over again. A lot of pressure there involved at that point where it's being advanced. Okay, it's pretty much everything. There's nothing much over here. The advanced lever, the rollers, the mechanism that controls the speeds, and uh, these parts down here. And that's pretty much it. Okay, that pretty much ends the uh, tour of the OM-1. Switch that over. No, I don't see any other parts on my desk that uh, we need to look at or discuss. That's pretty much it. The um, OM-1 was a, a simple made camera, unlike the uh, Nikons or Minolta's. And it was made simple because it had to be small and had to be light. And um, I always enjoy working on them because they are so simple. They have extremely accurate shutter speeds, even after all these years, much more so than the uh, Nikons and Minolta's of the day. Um, I don't know why. The uh, Something about the design of the shutter, I guess. But um, anyway, I'm glad you dropped by. Hope you enjoyed the tour through it. And uh, later.